Welcome to this week's and this new year's uh, program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your host, Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And our guest today is Kevin Shields, PBSA uh, at UC Berkeley. He'll be explaining that uh, and other things too. And the first thing I'd like to begin with is, as we usually do, comment on Will's shirt. Tell us about your shirt, Will. I'm glad you asked. This week's shirt is my new Shoreshim shirt. I got it when I went on birthright to when I went to Israel last month. I was there for two weeks. That's one of the things we are going to be talking about on this program today. So, Will, tell us about your trip. I'm glad you asked. I was in Israel for two weeks. I rode a camel. I floated in the Dead Sea. I climbed a mountain. I went to a chocolate factory. I flo I rode a jeep. I went to the Holocaust Museum. I went to a bird sanctuary. I I went to the Israeli Tank Museum. It sounds like you did a lot. What was this uh, program for, Bill? It was for students. It was a program that takes students with autism to Israel. Every almost everyone there had autism, or or Aspergers. It sounds very interesting. So tell us some more about the trip. Certainly, I I met tw I went on the trip with twenty two other students with with autism or Aspergers. They they were all from different from different cities from different cities in the United States. Interesting. I understand that this is a, a nationwide program that takes approximately 22 uh, individuals, young adults, uh, with Asperger's or autism uh, from around the country, and that the selection process is quite involved, but it can be done online. Is that correct, Will? Yes. I understand that for our viewers who are interested in this program, either for themselves or their family or friends, the website is www birthrightisrael.org. Again, that's www.birthrightisrael.org. And now toward the main portion of our show and our guest, Kevin Shields. Will, will you take it from there? Sure. Kevin, tell us about your current position. Um, I'm the coordinator of part of a Department of Rehabilitation funded program at UC Berkeley. Um, my part of it is to get students confident and prepared for the second part of the program, which puts them into internships and gives them connection to employment. Tell us about your background. Um, my background, um, I was into the hardcore punk rock scene in Los Angeles, and um, I dropped out of college to hop trains across the country and was very into the homeless rights movement. And um, I wasn't very good at panhandling, and I was in Berkeley, and I found that if I walked around campus, I could find flyers to take psychological tests, like putting puzzles together, and they would pay you like 10 bucks. And one day I was walking around, and I found a flyer to work with people with disabilities, and I thought, my God, that's the perfect job for me, because I'm not working for some evil corporation or something. And I started working for the program, and... Um, and then I went on to uh, move to Florida for a few years where I ran an independent living program for people with autism and people with traumatic brain injuries. And eight years ago, I returned to Berkeley to take over the program I used to be a staff member in. And the first thing I wanted to do was open it up to autistic students um, because until then, it had only been serving people in wheelchairs. Um, and since then, now we serve students with any kind of disability, but the, the main group we serve is students on the autism spectrum. Tell us about the UC Berkeley disability position. How many students do you work with? Well, um, in the program total, we have 55 students, but not all of them are on the autism spectrum. Um, and a lot of the students have multiple disabilities, so I may have students with autism but who also have attention deficit or disorder, for example. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about what the program involves? Since you do serve a very diverse population, I would think there would be a variety of things, but can you give examples of some of the things that uh, you do? 
Sure. Well, one of the tricky parts um, is you have to be a UC Berkeley student and you have to be a Department of Rehabilitation client. And um, joining the Department of Rehabilitation is very easy. Mm -hmm. um, you just need to have a disability and a clear career goal in mind and sign up at your nearest office. And it's a really smart thing to do no matter whether you're going to go to college or not because they can help connect you with programs like the one that I run that can help overcome some of the deficits people may face from um, a lot of the IEP kind of structure of the K through 12 system. I um, often see students who've been um, over sheltered by their parents sometimes mm -hmm. or just not prepared for independence by the school system. And so um, programs like this help people get those skills to catch up with their peers so that they can confidently sell themselves in a job interview. Excellent. So let's, let's take an example here. Let's say you had a moderate to high functioning, uh, forgive the term folks, but that's what we have now, a uh, person on the spectrum who comes to you. What would you typically do first? Well, it wouldn't be a spectrum, Keith, if it didn't have <laughs> moderate to high to low functioning. We're um, not supposed to say that anymore, though, Kevin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> At well, least that's what I've heard. I've got to keep up with the uh, uh, new terminology. Um, so um, most of the time, people get a hold of me before um, school starts, and I'm able to point them in the right direction as far as applying and their personal statement. We have a lot of this information mm -hmm. up on our website at www.dsrp.berkeley.edu and then um, students apply and then when they find out that they've gotten in usually they've already applied for Department of Rehabilitation Services so they have their case open and I'm able to start serving them getting them into the right kind of housing situation some students may need a private room mm -hmm. or a room in a quieter area and I'm able to get them aware of a lot of the things that they're going to have to do at school before they get there. Because UC Berkeley is huge. It's like the size of a city. Yes. And um, the way that the offices and everything function is much different than high school. And the expectations of people to self-advocate for themselves are much different than high school. Parents are usually still a part of it, but it becomes less and less over time. And after the first few months with the help me and my staff do... Um, I must mention my wonderful staff member, Linda Atkinson. Um, Shout out there. <laughs> there you go, Linda. Um, so um, with that help, after a few months, most people don't need much from us, mm -hmm. maybe periodically coming in to handle some kind of problem or question that comes up, but that usually takes care of it. And then we have some ongoing workshops and groups and events that people come and participate in. Very, very interesting. I have a thought. You mentioned if I hear correctly that the program currently serves 55 individuals mm -hmm. and I'm thinking Cal has approximately 28,000 students correct oh more than that oh, okay. I, I believe like 37,000 undergrads okay um, oh, some, somewhere around that so yes there's a lot more people on the spectrum and a lot more people with disabilities some people because of the stigma of disabilities choose not to disclose some people get by all right doing it their own way mm -hmm. um, and there's other people that are getting services. The Disabled Students Program serves almost 2,000 students, but that's with academic accommodations. Our Department of Rehabilitation funded services go above what's mandated. Um, and a lot of people just don't connect with that. And um, a lot of that problem is just the history of working together with the different offices. Mm -hmm. And we actually just had um, a lot of training this week to get the staff there ready to start serving, sending more people our way um, because they're out Excellent. there. They're just, and, and they could use the help. They just don't know. So we're finally got a budget to create promotional materials and like that. Um, and it's still a lot of this is the change. The, the program that I run has been around for 42 years, but mm -hmm. most of its history it was famous for just serving people in wheelchairs who needed personal care. And it's changed over the last few years and the word kind of is still getting out. That sounds really good. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to be serving around 165 students would be more like what the numbers should be. I understand your program offers a variety of workshops and internships. Could you tell us about those? Sure. So we have um, a group that meets every week, a social, social skills for students on the autism spectrum. And um, we base activities around things the students are interested in and that they come up with. It may be, um, well, 
you name it. But our, our main core uh, component is a real class. It's worth two units mm -hmm. run by Paul Hippolytus, who's the director of disability student services at UC Berkeley. And he's created a course called Professional Development and Disability. Uh, something around 85% of people on the autism, even if they go to college, end up unemployed or underemployed. And a lot of that is just because they kind of fall off this cliff after school where they can't sell themselves in a job interview. So the class focuses on um, how to bridge the gap, not losing your benefits, which a lot of people depend mm -hmm. on, um, what the workplace is expecting, how do you see your disability as just a normal part of the human condition and as a special kind of attribute or superpowers that you can use to disclose your disability in your um, resume and in the job interview because people are going to notice that you have it and and when you don't explain that you have a disability then they end up wondering what it is and it's really important i think for people with any kind of disability but especially on the autism spectrum because it's so misunderstood is to be the one that puts out your disability in the way that you want other people to view it because without that you're le leaving them to connect the dots and they're going to get it wrong and misunderstand it so um, what uh, I work with a, a lot of my students on top of Paul's class is just role playing over and over again job interview skills so that you can say look I may have trouble looking you in the eyes right now but I also have incredible ability to focus on detail and remember a lot of things that other people may not and I represent a chunk of the population that your company is not tapping into and studies have shown that diversity is actually really good for business and and I think I would be a great member of your team and to be able to sell it in that positive healthy way uh, just really touches people's heart help them remember you and understand how how your disability actually works instead of whatever they've seen from you know, most people uh, uh, just no Rain Man as far mm -hmm. as autism, and they're going to just think of it in that way unless you let them know it's different. This is really good to hear. And also based on your experience with your students over the years, um, how do you fall on the uh, side of the out yourself, don't out yourself question? Well, that's a personal choice for everybody, but um, I've just seen it benefit people. I, I often, when I'm introducing myself to people, let them know that I'm dyslexic, I have attention deficit disorder, and I'm colorblind because um, based on the situation, it may be important if I'm in a meeting with other people, I tend to draw a lot of spaceships and stuff like that while I'm taking mm -hmm. notes during the meeting, but it's my way of remembering things and being able to pay attention. And if I don't explain that, people are going to misunderstand and think that I'm not paying attention to what's going on and I'm doodling instead of act that actually it's the way that I pay attention. So once again, it's a personal choice, but people are going to make snap judgments and that's just the way that the world works and it's not fair and it's not efficient, but it's mm -hmm. a reality of our situation. So I do encourage people to let other people know and to not be worried about it um, because it's, it's the fact that people feel bad about it and, and feel ashamed about it and hide it and the stigma that per perpetuates the whole problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. All right. Tell us some about some of the internships you've been placing student students in. Sure. Um. The, um. So, the program. Uh, it's a Department of Rehab Workability Four program. So employment is the ultimate goal of the program. Uh, I usually start students out early on, connecting them with just some simple internships, something that they. Um, feel an affinity to something that's easy or maybe even a part-time job um, somewhere on the campus uh, working in the cafeteria or the bookstore so that they can start to see that work isn't scary that work is easy that they can work and go to school at the same time as students move along and start to build up these experiences and become less and less afraid and more and more accustomed to working um, we start getting them internships based on what they're studying at school. Also, in your freshman and sophomore year, a lot of people really aren't sure yet what they want to do. And while they're at school, they may take a class or something that changes their mind. So by the junior, senior year, people are pretty focused in on what they want to do. And we get them usually paid internships with companies that we're hoping will eventually turn into their actual employment. Now, everybody's different some people are really shot out of a cannon and ready for it other people are very shy and and even terrified about getting a job so it happens at a different pace for every single person and for some of my students it's not till right towards their 
getting to where they're graduating where they're really starting to see the light of, oh, yeah, I need to get some work experience, especially if I want to go to grad school or I need to get a research uh, position. And so we, we uh, meet people all over the community and different companies and um, different parts of campus, and we use that network of our people to connect students with what will work best for them. Very good to hear that. Since you've been involved in the program over the past eight years, what uh, changes have you noticed in the uh, population of the spectrum uh, individuals that you serve? Well, um, because disability is becoming more and more normal and we're seeing characters with it on television and in movies, it's um, making everybody more and more aware of it. People still have a lot of misunderstanding mm -hmm. around it. They'll think that everybody's got you know some super mathematical skills when they may actually have a super theater skill or a super um, culinary skill. Um, but people are more aware of it than ever. And so companies are making more and more of an effort to tap into that population, um, particularly in the tech fields, companies like SAP, and Microsoft. Um, just yesterday, I had a big activity at a company called Workday in Pleasanton, mm -hmm. where we took a bunch of our students and they were able to shadow other workers there and ask questions about resumes and interning and, and be there in the work environment so it just feels normal. Um, kind of like when you take a bus, the first time mm -hmm. you're going somewhere, you're confused and looking at every road stop and after a few times you're sitting there reading a book and you're relaxed and we just want to get people eased in. Um, so those are some of the big differences that I'm seeing in, in the world is that people are going out there and saying, hey, we want to make such and such percentage of our workforce be people on the autism spectrum. That's a big change. Also very good to hear. Yeah. And I think probably my last question is, if we made you czar for a day, what would you implement? What changes would you make in the programs that you oversee and the ones that you're familiar with to help individuals on the spectrum? I love that question, Keith. Um, I would love to be czar for a day or more because I understand and love not just disability, but any movement that's giving people from an underrepresented population more freedom and, and to be a part of society because they already are and to use our, tap into our full potential of humanity to make the world a better place and so people feel more comfortable with who they are. And one of the big things would be to get rid of a lot of the bureaucracy. Um, even the way the school that I work for works or the Department of Rehab, which funds the program or companies, they all have these kind of set mechanisms and just it doesn't fit people into the roles that would suit them best. Um, and this even goes for, you know, economic class or having a degree or not. But um, it, it particularly affects students on the spectrum because they misunderstand so many of those subtle messages mm -hmm. that they're getting that it makes people feel that they may not be confident in their position and, and if we could just get away with a lot of that bureaucratic stuff and put people in where they're going to be most talented the world would work a lot better and everybody would be happier i hear you you're there and agree with you a hundred percent right on um will Will, um, I've watched a lot of the episodes of the show online. I think what you guys are doing is great. And I know it always starts off with you showing a shirt. So I brought a shirt for you. Um, this is a shirt for Disability Awareness Week at UC Berkeley. And um, it's a very disability-friendly shirt. It shows the UC Berkeley mascot, Oski, having several different disabilities but being active. And it's made with ink that's puffed up so that blind students can feel it and be able to feel the picture. And on the back of it, the logo of Disability Awareness Week is up really high so that people in wheelchairs, you can still see it above the back seat of their wheelchair. And it's the last one left out of 500. So I know you collect shirts, so I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. You got it. Well, Kevin, I want to thank you very much for being on our program. You're one of the most fascinating and inspiring guests that we've had so far. And I know we're going to be seeing more of you again. So yeah, thank you to once come back. again. Thank you, Kevin. You got it. Thank you both for having me. Take okay. care. And now we'll hear from our, our cultural correspondent, Stacy Kennedy. Thank you, Keith. Hello, Will. Happy New Year, everyone. Today, I would like to share, um, the first thing I'd like to share is I recently saw a, a documentary on autism and love. And 
a while back, there was a panel on it and a, a meeting where we all saw the movie. You can actually watch it. It's available. Um, you can stream it online. You can buy it for $10 online, I heard somebody say. But Autism and Love, it's such a great documentary film. You want to... It, you see the, the 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 passion and struggles you know that couples go through, but there's even individuals who talk about wanting to, to, to have a partner, but but let alone they don't you know even have a job or go go to college. You, you hear about the struggles they have, and then how maybe slowly they ladder up to that. Well, not ladder, maybe step up one at a time. In any case, watch Autism and Love uh, when you get the chance. Um, I believe you can watch it on YouTube as well, but again, Autism and Love. Next up, I want to share, Anne Lord Davins has a book coming out called Being Seen. It, um, it's a memoir of herself. It'll be out in mid-February, and you'll learn about her as an autistic mother, a French immigrant, and a Zen student. You can check out her blog and her website at autizen.com, A-U-T-I-Z-E-N.com. So it's like autism, except autizen. So um, pretty neat there. So yeah, Anne Lord Devon, uh, her book called Being Seen will be out mid-February. February 12th is a leadership lunch talk with the Berghoff and Bell Innovation about the Enneagram system. They will be talking about communication styles and the discussion in business and leadership. Tickets are available at Eventbrite. Um, oh, and it starts at um, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. February 12th at 55 Taylor Street, San Francisco, California, 94. One zero two. Um, they recommend you get uh, advanced tickets online for single events or for the entire series, um, whatever that will be. Um, there's going to be two other um, events where they're going to be talking about covering conflict resolutions and another on leadership. But th that'll soon. That's soon to be in the works. Right now, it's February twelfth. This leadership lunch talk will take place. Um, I, I suppose that the, the last thing I would like to uh, share, which I am interested in applying for, is there is an organization called Everybody is a Star. It is a special, um, first off, I, I want to mention it's, it's a nonprofit foundation with a simple goal to give, s give special needs individuals of all ages the opportunity to express themselves through the arts. And from what I understand, they work with singers, dancers, painters, DJs, and bands. And participants get to work in professional recording studios with experienced producers. Their goal is to make 1,000 videos by videos by 2018. Anyhow, so the special event that's coming up is a special needs appreciation night, Monday, March 7th at 7.30 PM. I will repeat this. Um, in the next uh, episode, just to, for as a reminder, since March is still kind of ways away. <laughs> um, but that, um, I, it does not say where, where it's going to be located, but you can go to everybodystar.org. Everybodystar.org. Howard Sapper is um, one of the head of the, of the website and the, and the foundation. And th this, this event is called, um, the, the way they're quoting it is spread the word to end the word. So that's pretty much it for, for this week. And again, Happy New Year and take care. Thank you very much, Stacy. Really good report. You're welcome. Okay. And I'd like to send out a word to our viewers that if they have any culturally relevant uh, information to our community, please feel free to send it in to info at ascend.org, and we'll work to put it on the program ASAP. So that's our program for this week. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. Stacey Kennedy. 
Thank you and have a great week. We'll see you next time with Ascend TV. Tune in next week.